when David asked me to speak, he said, do you have anything? And I said, I know there's something, but I just can't think of it yet. I was busy trying to be on time for my dad coming to leave the house. So we got to my aunt's, and I always have trouble with allergies whenever I go down to the coast, but all my relatives have pets in their homes, and I can't have that. So I went into her home, and she has always had one dog, and I know how that's going to affect me, but she has an extra dog now. And so I just, I could feel it, you know, within 30 minutes I knew I was going to be in trouble if I stayed there. And typically what I do is I come home and I take medicine and I would be asleep this morning and David would be here. <laughs> and that's how I would deal with it. And so I knew I had to be here this morning, so I told my dad, you enjoy the party, I'm going down to the bookstore and study. So I went down to the bookstore and on my way to the store where I was just going to sit and read and pray, I was remembering that God had been putting in my heart about the scriptures with conditions and the scriptures that and it's just been I've just been as I've been reading every morning I've just been finding all these scriptures where it's yeah there's a promise of God but there's a responsibility of from us we have to do something to get that and so that's been on my mind and so I all that sort of started coming to me and I thought okay all right so all right, Lord, so there are responsibilities for some things. And some things are free and something. And so I'm thinking about this while I'm driving. And I get to, to Target because they don't have a Barnes & Noble anymore. And I go into Target into the cafe and I get out my phone to look up a scripture. And the first thing, and I'm going to get on Target's Wi-Fi. And the first thing that it does is it runs this huge, long, lengthy terms and conditions thing by me before I can get on their Wi-Fi. And so I sort of laughed and I said, well, that's exactly what these scriptures are. They're terms and conditions. And that's exactly what, what uh, most of the scriptures in the word are. are that, you know, yes, we can have God's blessing. Yes, we can have his favor. Yes, we can ask what we will and it will be done. But there are things that we need to do. We have a responsibility. And so many times we think that we are not an entitled type of person, but really, when it comes to God, we are. And I've shared with you so many times, my, I have such a, I don't know, just a deep, deep personal interest in the children of Israel and that 40-year journey through the desert. That just, so much, I could, I could read that every day of the year and not get tired of it. And I do it, I do frequently go back there to those scriptures because I just feel like we learn so much about ourselves from those children of Israel and wandering in the wilderness. And so I thought about how that, again, and I know that I've spoken on this before, but how that God told the children of Israel to come up to the mountain and they were afraid. They didn't want to consecrate themselves. They didn't want to go through the effort. They sent Moses in their place and that got, that disappointed God. And God wanted to deal with them face-to-face -face as a friend, he said. And later in the word, he does talk about how that, that's why Moses had such favor and why God loved him so much, because he had that relationship with Moses. He could be face-to-face -face with Moses. And I feel like God wants to challenge you this morning that he wants that with you. He wanted it with the children of Israel thousands and thousands of years ago, and it's still what he wants of us today. He wants you to be his friend and he wants to know you face to face, better than your best friend, better than your soulmate. He wants to know you intimately. And so I started thinking about, you know, how that God wanted us to come up the mountain. And so I, I feel like God wants us to come up wherever we are today, at whatever level you're at with the Lord. If you haven't developed a, a prayer life, if you, have, if you pray one hour a day, I feel like God wants you to pray more. If you... If, you, all you're, if, if all you can manage is to come to church and be here and this is it, this is, hey, look, I'm doing good just to be here. God wants more. Take another step. I feel like God is telling you to come up. And so I started thinking about people who climb Mount Everest and even Mount McKinley, and that is that there are camps all along the way, and they're checkpoints. And people set up supplies and they set up food and nourishment and even oxygen at some points and when when you're climbing up this major trek of these high mountains 
there are checkpoints that you go up, uh, and it's just to sustain you and nourish you so that you can continue to climb. So I think today's message is kind of like one of those checkpoints. I think that God wants to nourish you and wants you to know that he loves you just like you are, but he wants more. He wants to be closer to you than you are right now. He wants to be closer to me. I get up early every morning and I pray and I think I'm doing really well. I read my Bible, I pray, I drink my coffee and that's my routine and I love it. I absolutely love it. But God wants more. He wants me to do more. He wants me to spend more time. He wants me to get up earlier than I'm already getting up. And I know that. And I'm going to come up. I'm going to take another step. I'm going to go higher. And so today, I want for you to think of this as your oxygen and your boost. This is vitamin-rich food to nurture you and give you oxygen so that you can take another step, go a little higher. Everywhere we look, we have terms and, and terms and conditions or agreements that we're always trying to, you know, we always have to agree to. If you win a prize at a radio station, you have to sign an agreement to get it. If you buy a car, even with cash, you have to go through all the conditions and contracts and agreements. If you want to get iTunes on your phone or your computer at home, you have to sign their, their you have to agree to their terms. If you want Google Maps, you have to accept their terms. If you rent a car, buy a plane ticket, go on a cruise, have your house exterminated, an appliance delivered, a repair service come, uh, they all require your signature. And you all have to agree, we all have to agree to their way of doing business. Have you ever gone to Sam's Club? You are going to do it their way or you are not getting what you want. You will do, I mean, it's like being at a military commissary. You are going to do it their way. <laughs> You're not going to go get fuel before you go in if you don't have a card. So when I was in Target yesterday and I saw their terms and conditions, I just laughed and I thought that's exactly what these scriptures that God's been bringing to my mind are. They're God's terms and conditions. <laughs> and so I've heard people say that healing is ours. And, and it was bought and paid for on the cross, and it's ours. And that's true. It is. All, but um, all we have to do is take authority over sin and accept it. So, again, we're accepting his terms and conditions. We don't typically read our terms and conditions too much, do we? I know I don't. I flip to the bottom as fast as I can and click that thing so I can get what I want. And I could agree to giving every one of your contacts out of my phone or, sorry. Um, I could, you know, I could be agreeing to, you know, just, just almost anything. You know, you're first born on his 32nd birthday. I don't know what I've agreed to. I mean, I just want, if I want Google Maps, I just click agree and give me the map, you know. And so... We do that. We don't even think about it. And I think that we've done the same thing with God's word. We want the good things of God. We want salvation. We want healing. We want to be an overcomer. We don't want to have guilt in our lives. And so we just think, well, I'm a Christian. I should have those. Why don't I have those? Well, you haven't read the terms and conditions. You don't know what your agreement says. I think that uh, the, the one that is so, um, I think, I, as I started thinking about this and putting this together, I think I was thinking of, well, how could someone, you know, come back at this and how, how is this, you know, playing the devil's advocate in my own mind? How could somebody say, you know, how is this not true? In what cases? And I thought, okay, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes, oh, wait, that whoever believes on him, we have to believe. So that's a term and condition. First, we have to believe. Then we won't perish and we'll have everlasting life. So we have to believe to be saved. Second Chronicles 7.14, this is one of the scriptures that I think is so um, apparent in this, if you think of it in this vein, and that is people say, you know, I've heard this so many times, if my people who are called by, name, by my name will humble themselves and pray, then I'll hear from heaven and heal their land. Have you ever heard that? There's a whole big middle clause that we leave out in that scripture. And that's our part. If we humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. 
That's a big clause. That's a big term and condition. I feel the spirit of the Lord saying today that if we do our job, he'll do his. And yet we so many times feel like we have an entitlement. It's like, God, you said you would heal me. I've done it myself. Why won't you heal me? You said that Jesus came to heal our afflictions. Why am I still hurting? And yet when you start reading the word, you say, okay, maybe I need to go a little deeper. Maybe I need to climb a little higher. Maybe there is. Now, God, his healing and his love are not contingent on our actions. But sometimes, depending on who we are and what God wants us to do and how he wants us to answer, there may be a contingency clause, and maybe he does want us to do something more before he does something more. Deuteronomy 11, 13 through 15, and 22 through 23 says, um, I'm just going to turn there right quick. Oh, Jesse's got it. I'm sorry. Um, no, let me turn there. Sorry, Jesse. I didn't give him notes quite like David does, so it might be a little different today. <laughs> So Deuteronomy 11, 13 through 50 says, So if you faithfully obey the commands I'm giving you today to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I will send rain on your land in its season, both autumn and spring rains, so that you may gather in your grain new wine and oil. I will provide grass in the fields for your cattle and you will eat and be satisfied. And then verse 22 and 23 of that same chapter says, If you carefully observe all those commands I'm giving you to follow, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to hold him fast, then the Lord will drive out all those nations before you, and you will dispossess nations larger and stronger than you. Now remember I told you about how much I love the children of Israel, and that's what he's telling them about when they go into their new land. But there's a, there's a contingency clause. There's a term and agreement. And that is, if we love the Lord our God with all our hearts. And this word that he spoke to the Israelites, he means for us too. So when we get ready to go to a, different, a new level, when we get ready to climb and say, okay, Lord, I'm doing better, I'm closer to you, this is a new level, now I'm ready to progress, I'm ready to advance. And then we say, hey, wait a minute, this isn't perfect. You know what? The children of Israel, when they got to Canaan land, there were giants there. And this is the scripture where God is telling them, look, if you love me with all your heart, then you can drive out nations that are larger than you, that are stronger than you, and I'll go before you and I'll do it for you. But we think that we ought to be able to just put a little effort into it and then everything be perfect. But God is saying, love me with all your heart, with all, all your soul. Follow after my ways. What does that mean? It's spelled out. Are we reading the terms and conditions? Do we know what that means? Then we need to spend more time in the manual, in the terms and conditions contract, to find out what does that mean? What does it mean to love him with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our might? What does it mean to follow after his ways? God says if you faithfully obey, if you love the Lord your God, and if you serve him. We want the benefits without our responsibility. God says if we carefully observe, if we love the Lord and walk in his ways and hold fast to him, that means trust him. How many times do we fall apart and we say, how can I do this? This is impossible. I can't handle this. This is too much. God's forgotten me. He's failed me. God says, if you hold fast to me, that means when things are falling apart, you say, boy, this is going to be good. I don't know how God's going to do this, but let's watch. Stay tuned because this is going to be amazing. God is about to pull a rabbit out of the hat, and I can't wait to see how he's going to pull this off. I've said that before. Okay, God, come on, you're going to show off with this one because I don't know how this can possibly turn out good. And you know what he does? He makes it turn out good in every direction. I think something is so horrible and nothing can possibly be good from it. And God shows me that it's not just one good thing. It's facet after facet after facet, situation after situation after situation, where I see that if I had had my way, which is always the easy way, 
nothing good would have come up of it except I would have gotten my way. But by going through it God's way, there's good here. There's good here. There's good here. There's good here. So trust in the Lord. Psalms 91, 9 through 10 says, If you make the most high your dwelling, even the Lord who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. How many of us say, Where are your angels, God? You said you'd protect me. What is this? And yet... So many times, if you just think about it, my grandmother used to tell me all the time, things could always be worse. So instead of thinking, where were you? Think, what did he keep me from? If, if this happened, then what did he keep me from? I feel like the Lord put this on my heart for you this, this morning or last night. And that is, is that, um, that we live as one expecting the benefits of marriage. The joint checking, the safety, the physical affection. We throw around his name as if it's ours, but we haven't made a commitment of obedience. We haven't followed through and devoted ourselves to God. So we're dating the Lord, but expecting marital benefits. God wants us to commit. He wants us to commit our ways to the Lord, our mind, our body, our soul, our spirit, all that we have. We think that when we do what we do, which might be come to church, it might be volunteering, it might be, you know, donating some things or helping some, we think that whatever that is, that that's our good service. And we think, hey, God, you owe me something. And God is saying, come closer, come face to face, be my friend, and let me just, let me just fill you with these things. And let me show you. There's a scripture that says that blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. I feel like God has shown me something recently, and that is when we have love in our heart, really pure love, where we can love anybody, and they, anyone can do anything to us, and we just say, all right, you can do something to me. I've already made up my mind. I'm going to forgive you, whatever that is. Whatever you do to me, I'm going to forgive you. When we have that kind of pure heart, we see God in everything. And I've always thought of that scripture as when we get to heaven, we're going to see God. But I feel like when we have a real God heart, we see him in everything. People that we might judge previously, we say, wow, they must have had a rough time coming up. People that we might have been disappointed in, we, suddenly we feel grace for them. We say, wow. You know, I was raised not to do that. I guess they weren't. They just didn't have the same type of home that I had. That's sad. Instead of, how dare them <laughs> treat me that way? And so when we have a God heart, then we can see God everywhere. We can see his attitude and we can see his grace. So I want to ask you, are you reading the word? Are you hearing the word? Are you faithful in service to the Lord? I'm not talking about just coming to church. I'm talking about doing things for the Lord. Are you praying? Do you worship God other than when we're sitting here together? I think God's calling us to take a step up this morning and to commit in a marriage-type relationship to God where we do have a joint checking account. And what's God's is ours because we're faithful and he's our everything. We've put everything we have in him and we trust him no matter what happens. And in turn, we can ask anything. We can call on the name of the Lord and ask anything and he'll do it. John 8.51, I'm just going to go through these really quickly. These are some of God's terms and conditions. John 8.51. Eight fifty one says, if anyone keeps my words, he will never see death. John 8, 31 says, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciple. John 13, 35 says, Jesus said, by this all men will know that you're my disciples, if you love one another. He's not just talking about the disciples loving one another. 
It's talking about people in general. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, and he will make your path straight. Proverbs 16, 3 says, Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. So if he keeps our path straight and establishes our plans, then we know that everything that we do has purpose. And we know that the things that we spend our time on are meaningful. And we don't get to the end of a day and say, what did I produce today? What did I do that was worth anything? Life just isn't worth anything. We don't get to that point. Because if we commit our ways to the Lord and trust in him and make our plans his plans, then when we get to the end of the day, we go, that was awesome. I can't wait till tomorrow. If you don't feel that, God wants you to. Have you ever had a day where all your plans were just ruined? Where you just think, I had this all figured out. And I'm so frustrated and I'm so disappointed. The word says, commit your plans to the Lord. Include the Lord in your planning. When you get up in the morning, say, God, this is what I want to get done today. Would you help me to do it? But if there's something that you think is more important than my plan, that's okay. Come and lead me in that. Proverbs 29, 18 says, Where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. But blessed are those who heed wisdom's instruction. Proverbs is chalked full of the most practical wisdom. <laughs> if you want more money, spend less. I mean, that's about as simple as it gets, right? <laughs> I mean, that's... So we say, how can we be blessed? Well, read the word. Find out. Read the terms and conditions and find out, how can I be blessed? What can I do? Instead of saying, Lord, bless me. Say, Lord, what are you blessing? Put me there. Put me in the river, Lord, so that I can get wet with your presence and so that I'm just flowing in the stream of your holiness and not always fighting to get my own way. So do you want to be blessed? This is, this is the manual. This will tell you exactly what to do. I want to tell you a really quick story. It's from 1 Samuel 15, and it's about King Saul. I'm going to just summarize really quickly, but King Saul, God told King Saul to go to war, and he told him to destroy everything. And Saul destroyed the weak people, the weaker animals, and he destroyed all the things that probably no one would have really wanted anyway. And he kept the best of this people that they were invading, including their king. And God specifically told him to kill, kill the king. God spoke to Samuel, who was the prophet, and he told Samuel what Saul had done and that he hadn't obeyed. So Saul says, oh, but wait, I, wait a minute, wait, it's not what you think. It's not that I didn't obey. It's that I was saving the best to sacrifice to God. That sounds so good, doesn't it? That sounds so, oh, I've got a better idea, Lord. And sometimes we do that. God tells us what to do. God gives us directives and orders. You read his word and you say, okay, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to say those things anymore. I'm not going to be around those people that are negative and but then you say, oh, wait a minute. Okay, so, Lord, you don't want me to go around those people? Okay. Well, they've invited you. And it makes you feel special now because they invited you. I'll go. I'll minister to them. I'll go and I'll be Jesus in the room. And if God has spoken to us to separate ourselves, sometimes God might have called you to be Jesus in the room. I'm not saying that he doesn't do that. I'm saying if you'd feel in your heart God's telling you, stay away from these people. They are negative. They hurt you. They make life harder for you. And then you devise a plan. That's what Saul did. Saul said, oh, okay, but I'm going to do, I've got a better idea, God. Instead of destroying everything, I'm going to give you the best. 
And so 1 Samuel 15, 22, but Samuel replied to Saul, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams, which is what the sacrifice would have delivered. For rebellion is like the sin of divination or witchcraft, and arrogance is like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. God does not wink or pat and say, well, that's okay to disobedience. His word is clear about what he wants from us, and he clearly expects us to obey. And more than the do nots and God's hard, fast against things, those commands protect us from things that would hurt us to begin with. God's, God's ways and his commands are higher than our thoughts and higher than our ways. And the reason that he tells us not to do things is because it hurts us. And he wants to protect us from bad things happening. So I've just given you some thoughts and ideas about God's terms and conditions this morning. So I want to know. I mean, if you had a screen before you that said accept or agree or continue, you know, what would you select? Would you push close? Would you push not now, ask me later? Some of those, some say that, or, or decline. Thank you, Jesse. <laughs> Isaiah 53, 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. God restores us and forgives us and gives us new beginnings to those who are humble and repent or turn from their wrongdoing. So I want to ask you today, Will you make a re renewed commitment to God today? Will you accept his terms and his ways? Will you step up to the next level? I really feel like God is calling you to do that, to come up closer to him. He wants to whisper in your ear. He wants to put his arms around you and say to you the same thing that he said to Naphtali in Deuteronomy. He wants to say, the one the Lord loves. That's you. Put your name there. The one the Lord loves rests between my shoulders. He wants you to rest. All of these terms and conditions, all of these commandments are so that you can rest in him and have a wonderful, easy, productive, good life through Christ. None of this is because God's a big bully and he just says, my way or the highway, look. So will you come up today? Will you accept his terms and conditions? Would you bow your head with me? Holy Spirit, as you draw us, I just ask for you to Explain to each person in this building what this means to them. Does it mean pray more? Does it mean spend more time with you? Does it mean separating something? Does it mean cleaning up our language or our thoughts? Does it mean a deeper devotion and dedication? What does it look like to each of us, Lord? I pray for you to speak to each heart and each mind this morning and help us to know what you would have us do to come up, to be your friend, to be face-to-face -face with you, to know what it is to know you as not only Heavenly Father, but precious friend. Father, I just ask in Jesus' name, that you would just minister deeply to our hearts and to our spirits. When we leave here today, I pray that we would continue to think about this. Holy Spirit, please be on our minds. Please lead us into deeper paths, into deeper ways with you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.